hello to everyone. Welcome. My name is Maite Mateo and I am the secretary from ARCOVE and I am going to, to present the last and sixth interview of this special event we are doing with Maria Eugenia from Objetos con Vidrio, Argentina for the International Year of Glass 2022. In this opportunity, we have the honor to talk with the artist and glazer Anika van der Mer Merwe. Merwe, it's okay, the pronunciation? Perfect. That's <laughs> Just, <fine. laughs> it's good okay. enough. <laughs> it's good enough. That's <laughs> I'm happy with that. <laughs> so welcome to both of you, Anika and Maria Eugenia. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. I'm very well, thank you, my mate. What? Maite. Maite. <laughs> Maite. Maite. <laughs> thank you very much Perfect. for having me today. <laughs> we are very pleased. So Anika grew up in South Africa with her family, and he studied fine arts at Port Elizabeth Technicon, where he part she participated in a stained glass course that determined his future as a stained glass artist. So she traveled to London to, uh, let's say, professionalize his technique on painting stained glass, but she also had the opportunity to work in different workshops and have some knowledge about restoration and conservation on stained glass windows. Um, on 20, uh, the year 2008, Anika returned to South Africa and she established her own workshop called Silver Stained Glass Studio, where she continued working and doing numerous works about stained glass window with her own designs that are very fantastic, we will see soon, and also some restoration and conservation work. So if everyone, it's okay, we will start now with the presentation so we can start to talk a little bit about Anika's work. I think it's, it's working now. Yes, it's okay. There we go, you just cut out for a second there. That's all right, no problem. Ah, great. Right. <laughs> Here you are. <laughs> okay, Me. so everyone can, can see the presentation. That's amazing. So to start to know a little about you, Anika, we would like to know where did you grow up and how is that your interest in for arts starts to grow and then how you finally get in touch with glass? Ah, well, I didn't get in touch. I didn't um, see any stained glass for quite some time until I was a bit older. I uh, grew up in a little farm town in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. And there wasn't a lot of arts there. It was mostly little, um, it was mostly sports and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, whereas my biggest interest was always painting. So um, even since I was a little girl, I was using anything I could use from making mud pies. I used to go and draw pictures on the walls with mud pies and the people used to get very angry with me because they couldn't get it off <laughs> and it had to get repainted. Um, so I did study art in school and I did mostly painting. So that was a really good transition for me when I did finally start doing stained glass because I already had a very good discipline in painting to begin with. And um, I went to go study fine arts after school. And during this time, originally I was um, going to study graphic design. That was my plan in the beginning. And um, during our first year, we did a bunch of courses. We did some ceramics, we did some sculpture, we did fashion design, photography, and stained glass was one of the courses. And it was a department established by Hunter Nesbitt, which was also one of the only departments in Africa that was giving stained glass as an accredited course at the time. And I fell in love. I did my first little window, as we all did, blocks with just lead lines and you soldered it up and it had all these colors and it looked like a little patchwork carpet. And I loved it so much that um, the next year I went and made it my major. So I graduated with stained glass as my major. Um, so after that, um, I ended up 
trying to make a career in my hometown out of stained glass, but there was, there was not much. So in South Africa, I can imagine it's difficult to develop as a glazer or as an artist in this field. There are not too many options. No, if I was getting one commission a year, I was lucky. At the time, I was painting wildlife paintings for tourists, the lions and tig yeah. uh, um, leopards and elephants. So that was how I was paying my bills at the time, hoping for a commission to come in, maybe, as I say, once a year at most. Yeah, and so once you finish your studies and you were so in love with the stained glass, how did you continue? Where did you decide to do? Well, they would at the when I studied stained glass, there was no glass painting part of our studies. And my 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 biggest um, aspiration was to do glass painting. And I tried within South Africa to find anyone that would teach me or have me on, take me on as an apprentice. But there was nothing here in South Africa available. And I decided to go and try in London. So I ended up, I think in 2005 around, I bought a ticket and I went overseas with 50 pounds in my pocket. <laughs> Not much. And I landed in London. It took about a month to find a job there. But it, it wasn't impossible. It was a lot of work. I mean, I, I pulled up the yellow pages and I pulled up the numbers and the studios and I went to go visit the studios one by one because at this point I was determined. I was going to go into a studio. I was going to find a studio and someone will take me. <laughs> they never choice. And I ended up visiting studios, calling studios, and eventually a studio did take me on. And it started small, like two, three days a week, doing a lot of cementing work and doing all the grunt work, a lot of that. And um, by the end, when I left in 2008, I was working and painting and doing restorations for four different studios. Which studios were? In London, so there's stained glass studio in South Mims with Matthew Lloyd Winder that I worked with, who taught me most of what I know about, or taught me how to do paint and how to work with the paints. I also worked with um, Celeste from Celestial Glass. I worked with, I did some restorations for Mark uh, from Laden Light, as well as some restoration work for a few studios, Tenby and Penny, and there were other studios as well. So your biggest uh, knowledge about painting was, as you were saying, in this workshop with that was like your mentor, let's say, and you feel that that's the moment where you maybe develop more the painting technique, but I imagine that then you make also your own the way your own method but this was like the moment or the place where you mostly were painting and learning about how stained glass painting works yes i had i had no style then i had no method or any way that what that i could say was my own style or technique yet uh, with my painting and my canvas painting yes but not so much with the stained glass uh, i used to work after hours so when you're working within a studio, you have to do a lot of studio work, a lot of stained glass repairs, restorations, domestic glass. You don't get a lot of opportunity to paint. So the painting normally, if, if, unless you're an experienced painter going into a studio, you'd have to do in the evenings in your free time to try and experiment. And you'd normally have an artist around that would be willing to show you you know, how to mix your paints, what temperatures to fire it at, and that kind of thing. And then from doing that in the evenings in the studio, I would eventually, I was given restorations to do. And from doing all the research and testing and test firings and trying different paints from that, that's where your knowledge comes from. I learned a lot about uh, painting on Albus Elskis, the art of painting on glass. So uh, I think Matthew just gave me the book and he's like, there you go, go and learn. 
and um, I learned a lot going on, on on YouTube videos and whatever was available at the time. And then the best way to learn is just to do restorations, because at the end of the day, you need to match that restoration as closely as possible. And you can only do that by testing your paints constantly. I had shelves and shelves of little pieces of tester glass and different paints that I tested. I mixed paints. Sometimes we had to even make our own paints to try and match what we were restoring. So from that, you, that, is, that is the best way to learn, to, to, to actually get some experience and to get to know your medium. So during the normal hours of work, that helped you to get more knowledge and practice about more restoration and conservation in London. And then, as you said, during the evenings was all this process about the little um, yourself looking for the ways or with the books doing all this research until you get the results and you start to understand how everything works. Yes, I used to put in like 12 to 14 hour days and I used to stay in the studio till really late because I mean, it, this was my one opportunity to learn. This was the one place that I, I could actually find everything that I needed to know and the knowledge that I needed. And um, as I said, that, that comes from putting the hours in and testing, just testing everything, different temperatures, different applications, different mediums, different mixes. Um, and that, that's basically how, how you learn. Unless you have a very experienced uh, master craftsman that can teach you these things, if you don't have that, you only learn by experimenting. And Unless you can do it at home. You don't even need to learn to do that in a studio. Yeah, there's a lot of things you can practice, maybe that you don't need all the facilities. So it's just, as you said, it's hours and hours until you see how it works and how it works better you for you a, also. You need a small kiln like I have over here. This is my little kiln. And this kiln fires five, six times a day, almost every day. Testing, testing, testing paints all the time. And I still test every day. <laughs> okay, so something I was interested about asking is if in England you feel that like these extra hours you were doing during, during the evening that were more maybe for you, for your personal approach, if on the workshop this was not never a problem or if you receive a like kind of helping from the people that was working there that see you interesting. Like, um, I mean, if, if in the workshops you have this freedom about could do your own thing without any kind of problem. At the time I was running the workshop. So I was, I could, I could stay as long as I needed to. Um, and um, the, the, the artist, the main artist, Matthew would help me whenever he was in and um, Yes, he was available every now and then for me to just ask questions and impart any advice and knowledge that he had for me as well. But mostly it was me running the studio also and putting in extra hours to learn the painting. But as I said, this was learning how to use the medium, but then eventually um, a lot of my, my learning came from the restorations that were given to me. Perfect. So after these years you were in London, in 2008, you decided to come back to South Africa and put your own workshop. And we are really interested about know how it was this for you, if it was difficult, if you get some support or some help for some organization to could do it, or you have to do everything on your own. How was all that? Well, um, I'll start off by saying that I didn't willingly come back to South Africa. It, um, I wanted to stay in, 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 in the UK, but for South Africans, it's very hard to get visas and works visas to stay in, 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 the, in the UK or even in Europe for that matter. And um, I tried really hard to stay. It was a big battle for many months and eventually we couldn't, they wouldn't let me stay. So, um, my, 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 the difficulties, difficulty started then already. Um, when I returned to South Africa in 2008, there was no stained glass here. Uh, there were one or two studios, but it was mostly domestic work. 
there wasn't um, any painters that I knew of. Um, and uh, the suppliers would, uh, we had a supplier, we still have the same supplier, and they would supply uh, spectrum mostly and spectrum fusible. So there's no access here to flashed glass or say juice or Lambert's glass. And worst of all, there was no access to painting medium here. There was no brushes, there's no paints, there's no rocher, there's no um, badges, there's, there's, there's nothing here in South Africa. And um, I think my, my first, uh, 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 first step was to source these materials in South Africa. Um, but I didn't have a studio to work for, so for the first four years, I had to, I became a sales manager and I did sales. Uh, we sold electronic cigarettes, I think for 2008 and nine, which was, was, was very difficult because I was an artist and I'd never had to sell anything. So it, it was quite a big um, leap for me to learn how to sell myself and how to promote myself which did help me today. So it's probably in a way a good thing that that happened. And um, I was then moved into wanting to do my stained glass and the sales work did not allow me for, to do stained glass and pursue a career in sales and management. So I decided to quit and do stained glass during the day and waitress and do bar work at night. So it, it, was, it was very hard to go from three years in London where I was very successful and working as a stained glass artist full time to becoming a waitress again and to do bar work again in my 30s after being a successful stained glass painter. Um, but I, I, I didn't give up and I had a dream and I, and I had to make it I had to make it like real and and I my dream was to have my own studio and then eventually I think in about 2012 I got my first kiln which is why I said all you really need is a kiln to start experimenting and to start small jobs and when I got my first kiln I started bringing in glass paints from lead and light in London we also happened to sell Prodesco paints, which is from Spain, the enamels and the colors. And I found a client called On Site Gallery, and they were importing furniture and windows from Argentina. And that's, that's when everything changed for me. So after these years that you were trying to set up your workshop or something during South Africa and a lot of work, you said in 2012, it was when you know these contacts is when everything starts to go better. You have your kilns or you can already start to do your stuff. And that's how maybe you start to get more commissions and how the workshop slowly start to work. Yes. So after this period, these years that was really difficult for you in South Africa to try to start with your workshop, finally, you could slowly get there and start to have your commissions. And now what we are seeing now is one of the works you, you did that it was for an Asian restaurant that you are working for. So we would like you to tell us a little about how it was this commission and how it was for get the materials, the design, well, actually, this wasn't even a commission at the time. I was working for an Asian restaurant and um, they had these two front doors that had these two long panels in the middle. And um, like I said, I was doing stained glass during the day and then waitressing at night. And I thought that this would be a really nice opportunity for me to put my work in somewhere where it, a lot of people would see it and something for me to work on. So uh, it's a design that I did of my own. And um, it was a piece that I originally made for these Asian windows and uh, Asian restaurants doors. Um, 
but it didn't go in there at the end of the day. So the restaurant got sold and I got to keep the piece. And um, that was also one of my first pieces that sold, one of my first fish that sold to a private collector. Amazing. So here we can see a little the process of the painting. In this case, you use a enamels or what kind of materials did you use to produce this for, window? For this one, I decided to use a variety of spectrum water glass as well as enamels. So the, the, the pieces at the top is actually float glass, normal clear float glass that I stained with um, blues and amber enamels um, to give it the grading from the bottom that was more the blues up into a more sunset at the top that would be on the water if, if you were to look un, 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 under the water surface. Um, the fish itself, uh, you can also see it, it was a very light, um, I think at the time it was a, a flesh, a flesh toned, uh, a bullseye fusible glass. The, the body and then you'll see the lower part of the body I think was also an amber water glass if I remember correctly and then I also stained the bullseye with uh, with the amber enamels also um, note at this point bullseye does not take enamel very well <laughs> yeah now that you are mentioning the materials so all these the glass all the painting you were always buying all these on other countries right as you were saying in south africa you couldn't buy it so you have to always buy the material outside to good work so what what happened is because i, I we did have we do have access to water glass and some fusible bullseye and spectrum glass what what happened is because i don't have access to um, mouth blown glass or flashed glass was I used to create my own colors with enamels. So what I would do is I would put a blue enamel down, which I would then etch away and I would put an amber enamel behind it. So I would create the look of flash glass, but by using enamels on, on, on float glass. Um, so I would say the fact that I didn't have access to these, to these beautiful um, mouth burn glass in South Africa is also what helped me push me out out of my comfort zone into experimenting more because I know what stained glass can look like and I and I know what what can be achieved but I didn't have the materials or the means to achieve those certain effects so I found different ways of doing it it's amazing, but it's great how you, all the research you have to do and all the process in order to, as you said, I don't have this resource, but I can make myself something new to could make it work as I imagine. I just can imagine you hours and hours doing this. And I think <laughs> it's remarkable all the work you put on your passion. And I think it's something very important to say and to congrats you because not everyone does it. And I think the results you get and the quality of your work is amazing. So I think you did a great job and you do an amazing job <laughs> developing the painting technique. It's just beautiful. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> this one that we are watching now was also for this restaurant, was for the same for the second door? Actually, no, the first one, like I said, the, the restaurant closed down and exactly. um, that ended up being my first fish. And then after that, like I said, that one got sold to a private collector. And I decided to do a, another window because I really, really enjoyed painting these fish. And I loved creating the movement and the colors. And I found that, that these, these, this, this um, subject matter allowed for me to play. And I wasn't doing it for anyone. I was literally doing it for myself. So there were no limitations. So then I did the second one, which is the first picture on the left. Um, and I just played around. It's a collage of some images that I found on the internet. And I would just take bits and pieces of images and I really just put them together. And I drew up this, 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 this fish. 
and it was mostly just the outlines and from that point onward I just I just started painting I literally I just had the outlines and I just put the paint down and let the paint do what it wanted to do and as I'm painting certain shadows started coming out and I would enhance certain parts and I was literally with this one I was just playing seeing what I could do with the medium seeing what I could where I could push the glass to and the enamels um, there's there's very little information for stained glass artists out there on enamels and if you start doing research there, there's very very little to absolutely no information I mean you can do your traces you can research your shades there's lots of information on Ruche but when you come to enamels you you hit a block because there there's very very little people who use them yeah it's true that it's something that as you said is work a lot on your own until you realize how it works mm -hmm. and about this piece what can you tell us about that that's my son. <laughs> oh, <Yes>. beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to do a portrait because I wasn't doing a lot of, I was doing church restorations, but as an artist, to keep your hand in and to keep practicing, if you don't do it for a long time, your hand goes out. So I was doing a lot of uh, portraits of people I know and paintings in my free time just to kind of you know keep fresh and to to keep my hand in and that was one of those pieces and in this case you have a an uncolored glass and all the color or the details we see is all work with painting always right yes so uh, the the center part with the portrait is float glass again and the rest is mostly spectrum glass Hmm. And at this point, I was also using mostly enamels, very little silver stain, because I didn't have access to silver stain at the time. These are, I think, are, are some pieces of a new panel you were working on? Yes, it's my current project I'm working on. So Hopefully by next year, when this airs, this panel will be done. <laughs> so it's in process um, now. Yes, this is about a year's, year's project that is in process at the moment. That's my dodo. <laughs> For you, the, the nature or the animals is something that, if, let's say, artistically or for your compositions, for your designs, is something that influences you a lot, the nature, or you have some kind of specific things that you like to use or that makes you do the designs the way we see them, or how it works, the, uh, yeah, let's say the design process. Oh, hello there. <laughs> Inspiration. Um, yeah, so I was just about to say, there you go. <laughs> um, I don't think that there's a very specific influence there at all. Like I said, with the fish, it was more about the movement and the shading and, and, and what I could do with all of that in glass. Um, I love creating movement in glass because a lot of people see glass as something that is static and still. And that's something that goes into a church or that is religious. And for me, glass is not just color. It, it's not just shading or lines glass can move because glass is a frozen liquid and glass in itself is, is always moving and to me glass is 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 in a state of liquid that that needs to be illustrated as such and that's what I try and do with my painting as well I try and follow the movement of glass and I try and um, bring that out in whatever my my subject matter is, whether it be a fish or a person or or a dodo, um, which was a commission, by the way, by Anahita Hisami, she specifically commissioned the dodo. But um, that that is um, what I what I strive to do because a lot of people focus on line work or shading or portraits. Um, I'm always trying to push the glass to to more than what we are traditionally, you know, what we know of glass. Great. 
great. And about this window that it looks bigger maybe than the other ones we were looking before. That's um, massive. Yeah, so maybe it was something, tell us about how it was this, what is this commission about and where is it? And maybe about the measurements, if it was a challenge for you or if you find some new yeah, things that you have to develop in this project. Um, this project was about two years ago. This was a, a panel for a film set, uh, Ridley Scott. He um, just did a series. Oh, I forget the name now. Race by Wolves. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and um, this, they, they approached me about three weeks before the episode had to start, uh, had the shooting on the episode had to start. And um, the production company approached me saying Ridley Scott wants to have a stained glass window for set and it has to be original. And whether I would be able to paint this in three weeks and it is a meter high by three meters high, uh, wide, sorry. Um, so in three, in three weeks, you said it has to be done in, completely. Yeah, I had to uh -huh. cut the glass, paint the glass, let it, cemented and fitted in three, in three weeks. weeks oh wow <laughs> i had i had some help hmm? i had some help but um, unfortunately i had no trained stained glass artists helping me so i i had people cementing for me i had my friends come in and i gave them wine and fed them and <laughs> I made them clear off paint and stack the kiln and everything that they could possibly do. Um, I literally just fed everyone and just said, come <laughs> help me. Um, it was, As you were saying before, you don't have the resources, you find a way to make them. <laughs> I did, I did. And I, bri I bribed people. <laughs> it was it was it was quite a, it was quite a it broke me i would honestly say i was working the full seven days up to 15 16 hours a day every single day by the time i was letting up the last side panel i think it was the saturday afternoon the fitting had to happen on the sunday i was crying i was putting a piece of lead in and i cried a little bit and i put a glass in and i cried a little bit i put the lead in i had my one friend going you can do this and I was just crying and eventually I just asked my partner to solder up the panel because he's done some electrical soldering and I think he learned very quickly how to solder windows on this as well and um, yes that was I think a very proud moment when I realized that I did this in three weeks and it looked very very spectacular in the set on the set itself I, I think it's what are you saying it's it's crazy, it's amazing, all the work you did. But again, I, I think that it's amazing to listen to you talking about all the love you put on this to make it through a part. Like you have a lot of complications in the middle for material, for resources. And anyways, you did your way. This is what you want to do and you do it. And I think it's, it's remarkable on your work. It's super. I like it's challenges. Very when I get a challenge, I'm there. It's like, I'll solve it. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I'm available for this. <laughs> the difficult, <laughs> I want it. So, oh, this project is something we are very, very interested about because yeah. it was a work you did for Argentina. It's a dome. It looks amazing. And we just want to know how is that you get this commission and how it was if, if you were in Argentina or the dome goes to you, how you did it, where it comes from. So this this company that I did a lot of restoration for on site gallery, like I said, they import a lot of um, furniture and artworks from Argentina. And um, I restored a few windows for them already. And this this dome, by the time I got the dome, I already had quite a, a vast knowledge of how to restore the Argentinian windows. I'd done a lot of research on their painting techniques and the paints that they use and um, the enamels especially. Um, the Argentinian windows do use a lot of enamel because they don't use a lot of color glass. It's mostly 
a clear textured glass with a with a lot of pattern work and, and enameling on them. And then the one day they called me up and they had this massive warehouse. They're like, look, we have a piece here that needs to restoration, but um, we think you need to come and have a look. And I arrived there and this dome was lying there in, in its panels all mixed up and the panels had fallen apart. And then I got, and it was just laid out on the floor. And I looked at it and I said, well, what am I looking at? And they said, no, it's a dome. Here's the frame. And I said, oh my God. And then I, they gave me this big box of separate pieces that had fallen out the dome. And they said, well, here's the box of pieces that we got with the, with this, with the dome. And I just looked at it and I said, well, what do you want me to do with this? And they're like, you need to fix it. I was like, okay, I, I'm sure I'm, I, I'll try. And I think it took me quite some time to put it together, just, just to see how everything fitted together. And um, yeah, that's pretty much how I got it. <laughs> Um, but from doing this dome, I probably did about five months worth of research before I even started with repairing this. Uh, the amount of, of, of support that you need to put into a piece that is vertic uh, horizontal or that's going to be go hanging down, the, how the structured supports worked, where the weights are, where it pushes down, and then I also needed to take in consideration that the South African sun is a lot hotter and the lead perishes much quicker because it softens from the heat. So I had to put in extra supports. And um, yes, before I even started that, I did about that five months worth of research and the restoration took me about four months. And so how was that you you have to move it to your workshop or where did you did all the restoration process for this dome well for you as you can see they're all separate panels so the the frame stayed within their um factory and i took templates from the frame to make sure that each piece would fit again and um, then i would fetch three panels at a time and I would bring the panels back. There you can see the panels as well. And I would restore them and I would put extra supports in them, paint the relevant broken pieces and replace them. And then we would put the panels back in to the frame to make sure that I would cement them first so that the cement is wet before I put them into the frame so that the cement would dry with it bent in place. If the cement dries and it's flat and you try and bend it then, then it, it, it just breaks. Um, and then I would fetch the next three panels and thus we just went around the dome piece by piece by piece. And um, you receive the panel, you do all the process you need to do to the panel and then this panel comes back where the frame is, you install it and then you carry on with the other panels, right? Bit by bit, yes. Then the work. panel got moved, um, it got bought by private residents in Cape Town and they had to cut the frame with an angle grinder to get it in and then re-weld it. But they didn't tell me this. So uh, when you cut steel, you lose centimeters, uh, millimeters. And then when you re-weld it together, it comes together smaller than it was originally. So a lot of the panels didn't fit anymore. <laughs> So last year I had to do a full restoration on it again and had to resize the panels, which was an absolute nightmare. But um, eventually it came together fine. <laughs> okay. So this panel was a Argentinian window as well that was um, imported to South Africa. And um, it was one of the very first panels from Argentina that I restored probably I think in 2012. Um, I restored the entire, all the lead work and then some broken painted pieces. And then I, the two side panels actually is, um, I had to manufacture those. I had to reproduce those to make the window bigger. 
Uh, this here, oh, there, there you see the panels on the sides. So those are just uh, reproductions that I added on the sides because the, the window itself wasn't big enough for the space. And you were mentioning before at the beginning about this particular about the Argentinian windows that they use a lot of enamels and, and color glass. Uh, you, you think that maybe thinking about this period, maybe it was also because there was not other resources like color glass in Argentina that particularly they work more with enamels? I thought about that and, I, and, I, and it was something that did cross my mind. Um, but they do use a lot of colored glass in their borders. So they must have access to glass for, for the borders. Um, so it's, it's not that they don't have access at all, uh, but maybe they have limited access. But um, I believe that these are from the Buxadera studio in Argentina. And from what I've seen a lot of their work, they, there is a lot of colored glass involved in the borders, but very, very little within the art piece itself. So maybe, maybe that particularly they develop more the painting and it's something specific about this workshop or the way they do the I think designs. it was their signature style. Exactly. Because you can recognize an Argentinian Buxadera window from a mile away. If you know what they look like and how they get painted, they, they are very unique. Oh, there you can see. Um, they're very unique windows and a very unique painting style um, that nobody, nobody else really does. That's very good to know. We have these little treasures in Argentina for all the fans that are watching this interview now go and they are visit the beautiful and visit some buildings and take a look to the stained glass windows that we have <laughs> people all over the world are are in love with these argentinian windows and people try and collect them i have seen many artists on instagram and social media restoring them so they, they there's a lot of them that has left argentina and they are literally all over the world great so what we are looking now if i'm not wrong this is dome that you designed right after your work from the argentinian dome no, this is still the Argentinian dome. Oh, okay. Sorry, I made the confusion. That's so we got that part. <laughs> mm -hmm. So these are from the Argentinian dome. Exactly. This is some other restoration commissions that you get. This is also from on-site gallery. Those are all the, the, the pieces from Argentina that I've been storing over the years. This was a mayor of Munich window in South Africa. So not only do we get Argentinian domes, uh, South Africa does have a lot of beautiful glass that was also imported late 1800s, early 1900s for the churches that they were building here. Um, and they were mostly mayor of Munich. Um, and that's what these are as well. So I've, I've done a lot of restoration on some mayors all over South Africa. This is also the kind of work that I did in London. These are my own windows. These are your own designs also? Yeah. Great. So these are church windows that I've should use. The first one you see there uh, is Springfield Convent in Cape Town and that is, um, why is my brain not working today? I did a collaboration with another studio, so a uh, Live Light studio and we, we finished this and installed this one earlier this year. So earlier in 2001, sorry I forget that this is next year. And this got installed and blessed, I think, two months ago. And um, so that's St. Dominique. And then the one next to it is St. Francis. It is a window I made, I believe, in 2016, 17, for a school in Cape Town called Bishops. 
and um, this is the St. Francis that I designed to fit in with the rest of the windows in, in, in the chapel, which was Mayor of Munich. So the borders are based on the windows that are already there. So I reproduced the borders, I reproduced the tops and the bottoms and some of the background and then the saint and animals I designed myself. I love your animals, <laughs> are amazing. <laughs> They're all quite cool. I okay. Oh, we are having ah again. So it was a little cut with the with the sound, but now I think it's okay. Is it good? Sorry, you're gonna have to do some editing. <laughs> it's okay, no problem. We cannot control everything. No. So we do just a little pause. And these details we are seeing right now, they are also for this church you were mentioned before? Yes, the uh, one on the left exactly. is St. Dominique, which is the lower part of the previous window, and this is a close-up of St. Francis. Perfect. I do enjoy designing church windows, and I've sold a lot of my drawings um so sometimes i get commissioned to draw there's one of my drawings to draw up these windows for other studios so you don't you just do the what is the cartoon like what we are yeah. seeing here the drawing but maybe you you don't do the window the window is done straight away on the studio yes sometimes i would sell my cartoons to other studios because not everyone can draw up cartoons that's that's a whole different <laughs> thing on its exactly. own exactly Another glazer we interviewed, Sofia Villamarín from Argentina. She mentioned that she's working actually in Mayor of Munich, and she mentioned the importance they give to the carton in order to could do the stained glass window. And she said that it's something that you have to really know how to do it because it helps a lot and it makes the work like it's easier. an essential part of the work in order to have a good quality painting. And it's great that you can also do this as a work maybe for if you are not able to do the window for some reasons but you can also work with drawing that as far as i see you really like it also drawing so that's amazing yeah. i do enjoy my drawing yeah, this was um that's the center uh, the first drawing was um you know the previous one sorry this one or the other one the one before this one. This? No. Yeah, here we go. That one. That is the center I find for my dome that I've, I've, that I've just finished. My own personal dome. You'll see there's a lot of influence of the Argentinian windows in there. Um, and the, the, the the middle, the middle circle is based on one of the panels you saw before. That was an Argentinian restoration. The circle around it is also based on another Argentinian design. And then the outer border of the roses is my own work. So I did use a lot of the um, Argentinian windows influence when designing this, this dome. So the one have... next to it is the, yeah. No, it, it just I, I found very interesting how Argentina have a place on your <laughs> on your artistic work. It's really it's really cool. The style really fits in with my style. My style is very very similar. And having done all the restorations, I feel very comfortable with the project because all the books are there. Style match how I draw and how I paint as well. So it's very similar. So it was it, it was it was a very easy thing for me. So these drawings that we are watching now, one is about the carton for this church you mentioned. And on the left, this drawing is for another project. Uh, yes, this was um, a, a drawing as well for a dome that has not gone ahead now. So that was another dome presentation. I might still make it. <laughs> After I Argentina, your fascination for domes start to grow. Yes, I'm on my fourth dome now. Oh, wow. 
cool. Then you tell us more about your own dogs. We want to know that. But something we want to ask you is to, as you were mentioned, the difficulties about material or some challenges that I think in other countries or in other workshops people don't think about. What other things are a little difficult for you at the hour about make a panel or what kind of problems you have sometimes or some things you have to care about that maybe in other workshop is not something usual or how you do it? Well, I, I would say uh, we do encounter in South Africa specifically um, quite a, a shortage of materials which you've spoken about. Sometimes I would have to slump my own glass for restorations because of the lack of a variety of glass that we have here. You can't just pop to a shop and go get yourself sea glass or mouth blown glass. So a lot of the time, if I'm doing a restoration, I would make an imprint and a mold, and then I would slump my own glass to make it look like the originals. But um, these things all depend on the fact that we have load sheds in South Africa. Um, and these are power cuts that we experience because of the lack of electricity or not, not enough electricity to support the entire country. And sometimes we would have two and a half hours of power cuts two to three times a day. Um, that happens quite often. And then sometimes we have no power cuts for quite some time. Sorry, can you hear my cat? <laughs> I have a lot of animals, I'm sorry. He's the inspiration, he's um, totally fine. It's <laughs> wonderful. Come on, stop me, Ali. Uh, no. Um, no. No, he's very upset, he wants to go inside the house, but I locked everything up. Um, so sometimes you'd be in the middle of a firing and you'd be an hour in and the power would get completely cut and it would be a two hour firing and then you would have to sit there and hope that you're not doing slumping or fusing because it's dead. <laughs> if you're doing painting, you'd have to wait for the power to come back on and restart your firing all the time. Uh -huh. You start your firing from the beginning. Um, so you gotta be aware all the time of when these power cuts are gonna happen. When there's no electricity, you can't work on the light box. So sometimes I wax up sheets of glass and I have to just put all my glass and then work with natural light, which is sometimes better than working on a light box. Um, so yes, you have to kind of work around all of that as well. Um, so it's not as straightforward and easy as, as, as it sometimes looks on, no. um, on social but media. I found that you, uh about the power cuts, it's really, it can be a very big problem if you are in a rush for a commission, for instance, the big commission you were mentioned before that you have just yeah. three weeks. Imagine that this happened a couple of days. It can be really a very, I would not have made problem. the deadline. Yeah, but I, no. I can imagine for you all these things, like I just found really incredible how you go through this and you always find for a solution. You have a plan B or something like, I think, it's not so easy for everyone to imagine all the things, all these obstacles, like for an instance, workshops in Europe or in other places maybe don't have all this situation. In Europe, it's very easy to get the material or if it's a big workshop, I suppose this problem with the power is not so big, so they don't have to worry about. And all these little things made the, each work like, yeah, more, more and more like effort and put a lot of organization and a lot of planning on it and it's not so easy at all no yes and, and it does it does make your 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 turnaround time in the studio um much shorter because now you have to always think of other things to do during those two and a half hours which sometimes like i said would happen three to four times a day so if you have a two and a half hour power cut twice within your working hours that's five hours of studio time that you have to fill with something else to at least yeah. keep production going. Exactly. Yeah, not yeah. easy. <laughs> and tell us a little about this picture we are seeing now about this project. Uh, these are these are some of my favorite pieces. These are collaborations with an artist called Retre Week. And she has created this world called uh, Molisha. 
and she's an animator and illustrator and her she has this this, this um a private artwork and work that she's created her personal pieces and um i've been in love with her work since i think since 2008 or 9 and um i met her about two years ago and i was like oh it's you and I was just so in love with her and she said I want to do some stained glass and I want to turn my pieces into stained glass and I and I was so excited that one of my favorite artists came to me and said that she wants to work together so we've been creating these stained glass windows that goes into her apartment in the center of town which she has converted into this it's almost like a museum for this world that she's created and um, you should have a look on, on, on Instagram. It's called Postcards of Malisha. And then underneath all these images, she will write a story. And these characters, they all play a role. And they're, and they're all these, these creatures that, that live in this world that has these messages. And it's, it's fascinating. This is the honey. It's all about honey. Honey is like the currency of this world. And um, it's, it's just, um, I, I want to go to Malaysia. <laughs> and um, so, yes, yeah, so we've been creating these pieces for, for, her, for her home, which, she, which is just the most beautiful place to go visit. And she has these sculptures also of these creatures and artworks everywhere. So it, actually, it, they, they are very happy there. He's the my bear and the, and the other piece. I can imagine it was amazing for you to work with one of your favorite artists. That's something that has no price in some point. It's like the best can happen to you. Like, yes, this is what I want to do finally. I know, I was so excited. And she actually came to the studio and helped me paint, which was even more exciting. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, some of these pieces has her own hand to them as well, which is, just makes it more special. And it was the first time you did a collaboration with other artists? Was the first experience for you? Um, yes, I think she was my first artist collaboration. I've done some with other artists, um, but this is, this is um, my favorite. And no, it, 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 it was a, a great experience and we're very good friends to this day. Great. We're going to be making more. <laughs> Oh, yeah, please. Eso te iba a decir si le preguntas si es esta, este vínculo con esta artista le puede haber traído, le, tra, le traerá también eh, nuevas conexiones para poder seguir haciendo este tipo de, de, de actividades en conjunto, ¿no? de, de compartir este, la obra. A ver si, si puede ser así. Yeah, so what Mario Eugenia was asking is if maybe when you did this collaboration with this artist, if this also was like, let's say a new door open for you in order to could do more works with these characteristics or with other artists, so you can work also on topics or on designs that are more from, from you or, or in this, as you were saying, sharing the workshop together, uh, this, this project opens to new opportunities? Absolutely. Um... Since I've done these pieces with Re, I mean, I, I got um, a lot of exposure on the fish that I've done. I've got a lot of exposure on the Argentinian domes. A lot of people started noticing my work. So I got more commissions through that. Through these collaborations with Re, it's just taken my art to a different level. This is more, this fits more into my style, like with the fish and, and Re and my style come together really nicely. And it is just illustrated to people what I can do. And, but not only what I can do, is what glass can do. And it, it has just opened up, as you said, doors for people to see that you are not limited to church windows or to craft. Um, it opens up a whole new world of stained glass can be fantasy, stained glass can be illustrative, stained glass can be fine art, stained glass can be anything you want it really. And her art just it, it translates so beautifully into stained glass that people have to notice and people have to see. And I, I think it surprises a lot of people um, in the sense of they didn't know you can do that with stained glass. And, exactly. um, yeah. 
from this, I've, I've had some, some really, really nice commissions and um, people wanting more of, of this kind of art. So I have, I've, I've been things that I can't share currently, uh, more private pieces or pieces that is currently in production that I can't, can't share at the moment. But um, from this, there, there, there's been a lot of um, commissions from private residences, from private collectors and people wanting more of this kind of stained glass because it, it, it's just, it's something different. Yeah, exactly. And as you were saying, stained glass can be much more, not just something to cover, a, a, let's say, a hole in an architectural space. Mm. Or glass also is art and can be much more and can communicate a lot. The previous interview we have we, was with Judith from United States, and yeah. she mo mostly worked producing stained glass, but in order to make an art piece they are mostly in light box they are not thinking for a building for an architectonic space mm. and also his work uh, her work as we can see in this case on yours i think has a lot of narrative content or as you say a lot of her imagination what she wants to say and show is on the glass and it's so personal and it's artistic and it's so unique and as yours yours is also it's totally different because it's your style, it's your language, is what it comes from your design, from your ideas. So at the end, you have no limits with glass. And I think artists like you or Judith show that on their work. And it's amazing for us to be able to see it now and to know it. And I hope you have more and more for the future. Yay, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And you, we need more, know, more freedom. In this to, case, to what... What I want to ask, um, uh, yeah. sorry that I interrupt you, <laughs> uh, because you were mentioned the the difficulty about get stained glass there in South Africa, but I see the the clothes of the bear. That's the it's glass or is silver stain that you use for to do that color? That is window glass. That's flat glass. That right. I yeah I am um, I whitewashed it with some white matting paint from Rouge and then I traced and painted it. I gave it, I slumped it a bit before just to give it some texture so that it's not just flat. And um, that that you see there, the yellows is uh, Protesco amber enamels. It's all enamels. Wow, it's just the color is mm. it's amazing. It's really powerful and it's not so easy to get the power of silver stain, but this this panel is beautiful it's amazing thank you very proud of but there, there's i mean uh where you see the darker gold that is um a dark amber um water glass mixed with float glass and then the reds are painted and red glass all mixed up together there's my turn yeah so this idea from the dome like after your work with argentinian dome you you said that you were interested about maybe the shape or how the domes work like how what inspires you specifically about work with the dome in argentina and how you did your own design So originally, my design is very much based on the Argentinian one because of all the, the, the knowledge and everything I've learned from restoring the, the Argentinian dome. So I applied it to this dome as well. Um, it's also based on a client that saw the Argentinian dome. So she wanted it to look similar. Um, but I wanted it to be mine. And from here, you'll also see all everything's painted the only color glass i used here is the borders much like the argentinian windows and the rest is all um, matted on the back with some ambers and some matting and then everything on the inside is all painted with enamels and silver stain um, on float glass and how long takes you to do your own dom? How much were you working on this commission? Um, 
I worked on it, I'd say if I'd had to put all the hours together that spread over two years to make this, it will probably be about six to eight months worth of work. Um, but because I had other jobs in between, so it was spread out over a time period of two years. But there was a lot of testing that I had to do as well, because uh, like I said, the South African weather, you can even see on the left there, there's some rust happening on the frame. And there was some, you know, some of the paint would, be, would become powdery because I'm very close to the sea. You'll see that the, the, the lead there has started oxidizing and started becoming white because of the sea air. Um, I, I live literally a kilometer or two kilometers away from the beach. So um, a lot of that is, is, has impacted my domes and I've had to actually, this entire dome that you see here was stripped down all the lead and reassembled with fresh new lead, which I then had to um, put layers on to protect it from salt air. I had to also put more tie bars and more structural bars on it because it would sag more, uh, more quick, uh, quicker than usual windows because of the heat mm. that, that, and, and the hail, because we also have hail here and the wind. So there, there's a few things that um, European domes don't experience um, and the weather's colder, the weather's different. So they, they can take a lot more beating over there than they can here. The South African weather is relentless. Mm. And, I was also asking um, the temperature there, how is the temperature? It can, really get up to, it can get up to 40 degrees Celsius on a, on a hot summer's day. Wow yeah that's a lot and sometimes even higher i mean it's hit i think 43 44 at some at, at on really like extremely hot days i can imagine but it's really interesting all you are saying that all the carefuls you have to have or, or this about the the ocean i find very interesting because as you said in europe or in other places that you, you don't even think about and all these things you have to take care of in order to do a in stained glass with these dimensions and in this case with this particular shape right because it's not just a, let's say a traditional a window it's all a challenge is really i see all your work and all the things you say about all the things you have to think and it's amazing you are great <laughs> not really seriously no not everyone can do something that what you are doing with all these difficulties for you is not not a stop there's a problem and you've made a solution and i think that makes your knowledge huge that you learn a lot it, each it, day. it's a lot of research I, it involves a lot of research so a lot of my problems i go and i also speak to a lot of people um i have good friends overseas that i can pick their brains i'm part of you know some stained glass associations and we're all asking questions so there's a lot of people and groups out there that are willing to share their knowledge i mean the american stained glass association have i mean you sign up there they have these zoom call uh, these zoom meetings and they have these even facebook sites where people share and people can talk about their knowledge and people can ask questions and People are just constantly, because stained glass, it, it's like alchemy, isn't it? It completely, when you put something through a kiln, it changes. When you put something outside in the air, it changes. I mean, there, there's so many factors to take in consideration. And even the smallest thing, like does silver stain go off? Because I used a, a pot of silver stain that I inherited from another studio that closed down and this thing was 30 years old and I, 40 years old. And I used it and the, the color was just dead. There was nothing there. So you're sitting there going, does silver stain go off? So these are all questions that these groups, they, they are there. And, and as if you want to pursue a career in stained glass, there is a lot of help out there. And there's a lot of people with a lot of experience that are very, very willing to share and is very generous with their knowledge. So a lot of that comes from that as well. That's amazing. I think, and I think oh, sorry, finish. Mm -mm. No, I was just about to say that also something that maybe people don't think about in this uh, profession is all the chemic stuff that is going on all the time. And as, as you were saying that maybe you do a firing and something can happen that you don't expect or you don't understand until you research and you see, ah, okay, so this is happening. And 
that's very important for us to know how the glass work, how the paint, paint can work, and it's all chemical, and it's it's a lot. But as you said, it's really good that there's organizations where we can have this information from. But I think it's something also important for people to know all the things a glazer has to think about. It's not just about do a nice drawing or be a good painter. It's much more. It's a lot much more. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of technical um, knowledge, even just with building windows, never mind domes, that you need to be aware of. Um, I think my, my biggest challenge with this dome, which I didn't have with the restoration because the pattern was already designed, but um, designing a window that is flat is very, very different to designing the lines on a window that is curved. So suddenly your lines, as you can see here, the, the con what we call the concentric circle, that's the line that goes around the top. When you're drawing up your pattern, and this is a three by three, a four by four meter dome. So you can't physically draw it up, it's too big. When you're drawing the lines that you need to cut your glass at, you need to get that angle right. And if you make it too much, if you make your curve too much, you end up with a scallop that goes like this which I ended up here with, unfortunately. Um, so you'll see there's a little scallop to my work. It doesn't deter from you know, me being happy with it, but it's not perfect. So my next one needs to be perfect. But um, then you know, th there's, there's a lot of technical um, things that you need to learn and technical drawing comes into it as well. That's something I, I haven't had done before, but I, for this dome, I had to learn. So when, when doing stained glass, or especially when doing domes, you, you go out of your comfort zone and you suddenly have to learn a lot of new things. You have to learn architecture. You have to learn um, your environmental um, impact. You have to learn about technical drawing to make sure that the three-dimensional curve works. Um, and, you know, and engineering, you have to know a bit of engineering. So I learned a bit of that too and how structural weight works and where the weight in the window needs to be wider or smaller, where the breaks need to be in the glass for the glass to be able to take the weight. So a lot of studios that do dome would know what I'm talking about. I didn't. <laughs> like I said, the Argentinian dome was already made. I just had to restore it. Um, by making my own dome, I learned a whole bunch of new things that I had to research and you know master. I'm not completely there yet, but the next one will be, hopefully. <laughs> but I think it's a great to see how each experience just make you uh, get more knowledge. And as you said, right, like see, you see what things you should improve for the next one or change in order to make it the way you imagine. And at the end, it's about that. This, I think this profession is a lot about practicing. And on your work, we can see the hours, the testing, the looking for the resources, all that work is what at the end makes the quality of the work and makes you able, I think what is amazing is that makes you able to can do any project, a, a real project, and that's great. Thank you. Those are the different processes of painting the dome. Um, from the this, one on the yeah this is more the lines and not, not the color yet right like the previous step so the piece on the right you'll see doesn't have any color yet or or matting that is just the float glass normal window glass and then you'll see on the one on the right that's when I started adding matting and that's where the color of the actual glass starts changing as well And then the very, very last firing, add your enamels and your colors because they fire the lowest. To a low temperature that the other painting you use. Mm -hmm. That you were mentioning that the last thing you do is the enamels and the colors because the fire temperature is lower than the other one yeah. you used before for the mats and the lines. higher, at least 100 degrees Celsius higher than your enamels. The details are amazing. 
you can you can see all the little each line each mat everything there it's beautiful this is also part of you can see there's a bit of testing happening there so what i do is i take my enamels and i paint them over a piece of clear glass and i'd fire that and i would take those little samples and i would place them onto the artwork mean, itself before i think I, I can you mean this one right this piece that you put on, yes, you that put piece on top there. yeah yeah so i do that a lot so i would fire pieces and i would place it over my painting to see what would happen if i would put that color there and it's a very good way to see what it's going to look like without having to fire it and then it looks awful and then you have to restart again. Exactly. Add some more center pieces of the dome. Oh, these are more details about the bear. The honey bear. So there you can see the robe. Oh, no. The flower. Yes, the flower. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, y pregúntale por el tatu que tiene en la en la foto anterior de This one. Sí, que es el tatu. Mario Genis asking if y, this tattoo you have on your right arm that we can see in this picture. And I think there was another one where yeah. it's, I oh know it's better in this one. If it has some meaning or something to do with glass. It is a ruler. It does. Ah, it it's a ruler itself. Ah, all right. Ah, there you go. It's a oh, ruler, it's 20 centimeters to scale. And um, my husband keeps stealing my measuring tape, which is normally in my car. So sometimes <laughs> when I get on site and I need to quote on a job and I need to measure up, but just to get an idea, I would go and I'd use my arm. <laughs> practical. <laughs> it's very practical. I, know. I got very frustrated. I was like, if... I was like, fine. I'll just get it tattooed on me and see if you can take that one. <laughs> now you have a, a ruler forever. <laughs> For it, well, I get teased a lot. They say that it changes over age. So I'm like, yeah, as you get true. older. So I'm like, I, I don't think it would age that much. But then I'll just take in consideration how much more I need to add if it does. <laughs> I'm, I'm also a fan of tattoos and everyone always says, oh, but it will change a lot. And it's like, I don't mind. I like them. I want them. It's part of who you are now. So if it changes, nothing is as good as a change. If tattoo changes with you. Yeah, exactly. Do you have any tattoo that has some kind of meaning or something related to glass for curious? Um, no, my tattoos are more personal. Um, <laughs> And um, I, 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 they're quite decorative. So much like my work, I like to put flowers and decorations on everything that I see. Everything needs to be made pretty. So, <laughs> so my tattoos are all very pretty as well, but they, they, they do have some meaning, not particularly relating to stained glass. Oh. So here we have the last pictures mostly of your more personal work. This is the one that is still in process, right? You said that it will be finished. Yes. Soon, we hope. Okay, cool. Great, so I will stop to share Thank screen you. now. I think, okay, great. Now we are, it's, it's amazing all the work Wonderful. you have Wonderful done. Work. Eh, sí. A mí me gustaría que le preguntes, eh, ya que en Sudáfrica son pocos, ¿cuántos son y si están nucleados entre ellos? A ver si se colaboran de alguna manera. ¿Una asociación o alguna comunidad de vidrieras? Sí, o un contacto, un contacto como para colaborarse, ¿no? Perfecto. Yeah, Mario, what Mario Eugenia was saying is as interesting to know, as you were saying in South Africa, it's not many people that works with the stained glass. If you know exactly how many people works on this field, 
And if you are in contact with them, or maybe it's like a little community or group that you are in touch or you know each other. Yes, yes, we actually did. Unfortunately, COVID has shut down a lot of the studios. Um, um, hold on, the internet's going. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> Um, so there's, there's maybe about four studios that is currently operating in Cape Town. Sorry, is um, that one... because, sorry, start it again since you say how many you are because it was a cat, so we have it clean, sorry. Shall I start from the beginning? Yeah, yeah to say how many you are or how it works exactly. There's quite and there's even fewer of us currently. I sorry, but really it was a big cut. We cannot listen to you so good right now. Mm, it's a shame. But yeah, she is a My my partner just got home, so he might have gone on to the... Ah, okay. Dice que llegó la pareja y que ahora ah. va a ver si puede mirar, porque está al lado el router, dijo que se puso al lado, así que no sé. Bueno, pero es, es Sudáfrica, es muy lejos. <risa> eh, qué tremendo todo lo que tuvo que hacer esta mujer. Es impresionante. Sí. Acá nos sentimos que estamos en desventaja, pero... Sí, no. pero esta piba levantó un imperio de... De nada, de la muerte misma, pobre. Es, es muy talentosa, muy talentosa. No, y And laboradora. Is... Ah, cool, super. Estre a mí, por eso en un par de veces lo mencioné, porque me, pare me parece tremendo decirlo. Sí. Porque, Viste, con un estudio al lado es otra cosa, con esto. Claro. I don't think Sundays is a good day for internet, because everyone's at home. Yeah, next week. <laughs> Um, okay, where was I? Okay, so how's the internet now? Can you hear me? I yeah. think it's going better. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so in South Africa, there's the, there are quite a few studios, but I could I could probably count them on two hands. I don't think there's that many. Um, and due to COVID, there's even less now because um, not a lot of studios managed to make it through COVID. Um, in Cape Town itself, I'd say there's probably about four operating studios that is um, um, making a living and, and managing to get through COVID. Um, one of them being me. Um, painting wise, there's only two studios, including me, that I know of that paint in Cape Town. So yes, we do have a bit of a community. We all do know each other. We try and help each other as much as we can. We do, when there's really large jobs, we would collaborate and share the work between us. Um, and, you know, everyone's trying to help. And if there's any painting work, I would try and share as much knowledge that I have with the other studios. There are a few studios scattered around South Africa that I haven't made contact with. And then there's uh, one or two in Johannesburg that I believe that also paints. So next, or 2022 for me is going to be, one of the things I've been planning on doing, it's been on my to-do list, is to bring the studios together and connect with all the other studios in South Africa and see if we can start maybe a little South African guild or um, even just a community or, or, or a platform for everyone to be able to talk to each other or share knowledge or share jobs. There's been a lot of, um, we've noticed, people that don't really know how to do stained glass have been pulled into restoring churches and they didn't know what they were doing so we sometimes get called in to try and fix what other people have done and this purely happens because people don't know that there are professional artists out there and because there there is no guild or anything for these churches have mayor of munich and and really old windows um to go to a professional. So I do want to create a, a better awareness in South Africa because even though we're small, 
we have a good community of artists and these artists can take these jobs on and we do have the skills and the know-how to take to to do these restorations and to do new work as well so i think it's more a, a question of people not knowing and uh, um my my hope for the future is if there's enough people doing stained glass and if there's enough people that are interested in painting we might actually get people to start importing more glass and to start importing more paints and make it more accessible for people here to start glass painting and to try their hand at it because i'm sure there's a lot of amazing artists out there that would absolutely excel in in painting on glass if they had the tools or the medium or someone to show them where to go or how to go about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank I think you. it's very important what you say about the platform or generate like like as American, the Americans do, of course, they are more. But as you were saying, you're a little group, but this communication changed the situation for everyone and make it better. So it will be great if you can do it. And of course, it's then let us know so we can also know all these artists all these workshops and help also to make the people know them and to for you to get material or whatever can be better in future that's amazing Mario it really sí. yeah no it pregunta. really it's dime dime so, yeah sorry. no talk Anika sorry no no I was just trying to say that it, it's sad when people and, and unfortunately we do have that mindset of where people say want to share this because people are, are keep the work for yourself the more people you train up the more competition you create and what people don't understand is competition is healthy and sharing and, and teaching more people creates a bigger interest which in turn is big better for the industry but keeping it to yourself and, and, and trying not to teach people and, and keeping your knowledge to yourself is very, very damaging and detrimental to the trade. Yo le quería preguntar qué dificultades y qué beneficios le trajo estos dos años que hubo de pandemia, 2021 y 2020, eh, estando ahí con, con su trabajo. Sí, bueno, eso, ¿cómo, cómo los vivió? Sí, yeah, so María Eugenia says, how was for you this the last two years with the pandemic, 2020 and 2021, if it was for you, because as you are saying, already it's very difficult to work on this field in South Africa. So with the pandemic, how was it? Was worst for you was a new challenge or you could keep your work? How it was it? Well, like, like as you probably noticed before, I'm, I'm all for the challenge. So um, <laughs> to me, it, it, it's actually helped my career um, the connection's unstable, so I'm going to just wait. Okay, is it better? Mm, I think I think now it's okay. okay so I'll start again. Is that I found that COVID has actually helped my career because um, the challenges that I faced uh, just taught me new things. But not only that, I've, I've been able to get more international work through the commission, uh, the collaborations that I've done and through the domes that I've done. So I've, I've been able to get larger commissions that take um, a year. Years. So I, I actually have been I've noticed that there's a lot of sitting at home and a lot of people want to do things that they didn't think about before. So if you're sitting at home and you look at this way, to wonder for so long people are now sitting at home and they're renovating and the amount of moment is insane all this time to to renovate their homes and home domestic stained glass i've had in the past two years is is more than i've ever had before the problem oh. is the other studios is trying to keep up with the demand as our supply has run low because we can't get glass into South Africa. Our last shipment has taken up to a year and a half and it still hasn't landed. So I've been fortunate enough to do glass painting. So I've been able to change my product 
for the client. So I can offer something new and different for the client that wants a stained glass window, whereas another studio that doesn't have access to glass or lead can't. So adapting your, I've been able to paint colors. I've been able to, um, as you see with the Argentinian windows, they're so simple because it's blocks of clear glass. And all you need to do is paint a few beautiful flowers or some drapery on it or a ribbon and people love it. Whereas other studios, they can't do that. So they are more limited to the, the product that they can offer or the windows or art that they can offer their clients. Exactly. For you, you can use a, a normal and color glass, but with, as you are saying with the painting, you maybe can open your possibilities to much more. But if you don't paint and you need this specific glass with this color, as you said, or you wait or it's difficult to find a solution. Yes, a lot of studios have, have encountered those problems, unfortunately. But it's good for, I mean, it's bad for them, but it's good that for you in the pandemic at the end was kind of positive in some aspect because for all the difficulties you were mentioned before, it's kind of easy to, to imagine during the pandemic, this woman with all this situation it has to be super difficult, but it's, it's really good that you could have a lot of work and continue doing your thing. And I, as I said before, I hope you continue doing more and more during this year and next ones. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ayer le quiero preguntar una cosa, si ella quisiera o, o siente que sería importante que, que enseñe lo que sabe. Si así colaboraría a crear ahí mm -hmm. ¿no? una nueva comunidad de, no, de artistas. Totalmente. Yeah, what Maria Eugenia is saying is actually very important. Like, uh, do you think you you would like to teach what you know about painting or you would like to do a course or go to some institution to provide this knowledge you have to future generations or students that are interested in stained glass? Do you think it's a possibility? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I have been asked. Um, uh, by, by uh, quite a few people if I would be willing to teach. Currently, I have so much work that I need to get to that teaching is a bit um, too much to take on right now. Um, but it is definitely something that I want to, when you know work slows down a bit, I will take on or offer, or maybe as I get older and I, and I want to you know, not work as hard <laughs> as I'm working right now. That is definitely something I would want to do. Um, I'm always looking for apprentices. Um, I'm always happy to take them on. Unfortunately, most of the people asking to apprentice with me is abroad. <laughs> so it's a bit difficult for them to come here. Um, so yes, I'm always open to offering apprenticeship um, uh, for, for in turn, I would, you know, teach and then in turn, I would get labor. So I'm always like, you know, offering people to help me and I'll teach them. Um, it's just always, the problem with that is people don't understand stained glass isn't as glorified as you might see it. It's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of dirty work. Um, it's a lot of physical labor that is involved with stained glass. It's, it's not about sitting at home or at a bench and painting pretty pictures before you even get to hold a paintbrush you need to know how to cut glass you need to know how to let a window you need to know how to cement a window painting glass is but the last part of your journey of learning about stained glass so a lot of people when they initially come into the studio are so uh, like frightened off by the amount of, of, of physical labor that stained glass requires that they don't come back. <laughs> so, um, uh, yes, um, you, you, you should always start at the basics, learn how to cut your glass, learn how to choose your colors, learn how to draw, you know, little things I try and teach people is like you said, the, the cartoon needs to be good for the artwork to be good. But a lot of people forget how important cut lines are and how important lead lines are because lead line work is an artwork in itself that can make or break your piece and um, choosing the right colors can make or break your piece choosing the right glass 
can make or break your piece. So these are things that you need to think about before you even start painting on glass. So like I said, I, I'm always open for apprenticeship, but you know, you've got to be willing to do the hard work as well. Thank you, thank you. I will consider the apprenticeship <laughs> because I am <laughs> interested on the on the yeah. all the work. <laughs> uh, and wow, I invite yeah, but it's great. I think I think someone that is interested on in stained glass will not mind. I mean, also as a glazer, I do it, and it's part of the process. You have to select the glass before you paint. You have to do it carefully with time, so it's the right uh, goal. And also, as you were saying, the lead. Think about the design, maybe. It's normal that maybe you do two or three times the cut line in order to look for the, be the best way to work, right? It's, but it's all a process. Um, mm. Personally, I, I am interested. I take notes for <laughs> possibilities for apprenticeship. But, but I'm, I think it's cool if someone that is interested and would like uh, to contact you and maybe it's even something great for you, as you are saying, you have someone that helps you you are teaching, but it will be great, I think, what you are mentioned that also if in the future you are able to have more time to could uh, do at your studio or in another one's a course or something with more time because teaching is a lot of time on organization. We were talking in the previous interview about this also with Judith that she works a lot as a teacher and it's a part of her work, but you have to have time because it's also a lot of time she does at her studio. But something she was saying is about this important thing about you have a knowledge about something, some specific that not a lot of people do as you, but with, uh, that is important to give to others, share with others. And so that people have also that knowledge in order to create new things, to develop maybe in the future new techniques. And it's something crucial, I think, right now for for us, the future stained glass professional generation and even younger people to know all this and to learn from people like you or Judith or the other people we were interviewing, Castricio, he works a lot as a teacher as well. And I think at the end, these yeah. people will give us the tools we need for the future. That is learn how to love the material and how to work on it in order to create what can look impossible, but is possible. That's just the thing. And, and also to create an understanding that we are not confined to making traditional glass. And that's also one of the reasons I admire Judith so much. Um, her work, there's nothing traditional about her work. Her work is mind blowingly um, appropriate to our time. And, and, and so taking the medium to, to, to levels that you know nobody's ever seen before and I used to look, I remember I used to look at her work and how does she do this? I used to try and figure it out. And then when I finally figured out how she does it, I was like, I never in a million years would have thought to do it like that. But if you think about it, it actually makes sense. But it is such an, an incredibly um, intricate process that she's created. And it just makes people think out the box. It's like, well, if she could think of that, what, what else can we do with glass? And what else can we create? And um, it's not just her, there's, I mean, there's so many artists at the moment creating the most amazing things with glass that we didn't even think was possible. And that is what I love about discovering new artists constantly. I'm like, oh, wow, what did she do? How did she do that? Or, oh, wow, what did this person do? Or how did they make that glass? And it, it's just, it, it's so exciting. If you, if you just go out there and you look and you find these artists and you see what they're doing and you just have to shake the world and go, can you see what's happening here? This is amazing. And I feel like stained glass is in its growing stage. It's still a, a baby in the world right now. And it, it, it is going to grow into a medium that people do. This is not just decorative and, and it's not just an expression of, of art which people are now starting to wake up to, but it's also functional. And that makes it a piece of art that is completely different to anything else. It's more like ceramics where you can have a beautiful piece of art and it becomes functional. And it's also a master craftsmanship where you can actually make a living because you have a tradesmanship 
whereas the other arts you don't really have that so you have something that allows you artistic freedom it is functional and you can make a living from it and how many art forms do we know that can give you all three of those things in one i think it's a great reflection what are you saying right now this aspect about the functional thing it's that was something that for me in the career was very interesting how as you say it can be a piece of art that is very beautiful but also you are able to give it a use for something and also not just for a window in a stained glass panel can be more than a window like if we take it out of the context of, of windows or architectonic sites you can build something with glass for another thing or for another use and it can work perfectly and i think that's something very interesting to explore right now that we have another maybe possibilities or techniques or things or as you said we see people like judith or like you also or uh, we interview also to Castricio that he also developed a technique that was not used before and was really important. And he's one of the most important glazers in Spain. And it's like, okay, if this was possible, if these people made this possible, for sure we can do more and more. And I think, uh, and I think it's really also important what you say about you see something and you get this curiosity and go through this and investigate because there's a lot of information and you learn about the glass, looking for this artist, going through the technique, how they do it, where they do it, with what materials, and all this at the end just open a wonderful world and open new chances for the future. And that's very important. I agree. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, to finish something we always are asking to all the glazers we were interviewed, during this special event for the International Year of Glass in 2022. Is, uh, you mentioned some things already, but uh, with Maria Eugenia, we were thinking that something important to listen from you or the other glaciers we were interviewing is, how do you see the stained glass in the future or for the future generations? This connection, we were talking a little bit about that, how to bring this knowledge and the importance of bringing and how to do it because as you were saying a lot of people maybe it's not so interesting but how can we do to bring this knowledge and to make the stained glass window continue as a profession on the future well personally i think we're already doing it i think we're, we're already um taking stained glass to a different level than what it was before people are already noticing that stained glasses are not just confined to a traditional art form. Um, people are already seeing that, you know, in Tom Fruin with his um, water tanks in, in America, I'm not sure if you've seen those. He does these, these, these um, skyline water tanks, which is these, these blocks of color. Things like that, um, that that's made, made quite, um, a big that has created quite a big interest in stained glass where people didn't have it before so artists doing things like that that is also in the landscape and and making people aware that you know stained glass doesn't have to be in a church it can be something that is a random water tank in in in, in the city um i think it's just that it, we need to keep on doing what we're doing and I think people in the past, you would only learn stained glass from a master if you're apprenticing and painting. I think that that has been very detrimental to our craft. I think people need to share the knowledge and make people aware that this they can do stained glass and painting. It really isn't that difficult. Once you realize how to paint a trace line and how to fire it and how to apply color or how to fire it. You don't even have to use enamels. Really, you only need silver stain. And from that alone, I mean, how difficult is it to learn those, those basic techniques? So it, it, I think people are intimidated by stained glass at first, and then they realize it really isn't that hard. Um, and I think that desire comes from a love for the medium. And I think if, if you're interested in stained glass, you already have a love for it. It's, it's not something, you know, that you have to grow. You either, you know, look at it and you think it's the most beautiful thing or you don't. Um, 
but yes, I think stained glass is going through a revival, especially coming from a, a country where I am, where it, it is so limited. And to see even here, how people are realizing and, and opening up to the idea of modern stained glass and, and wanting pieces of art in their house. There is, uh, I think it, it, it just shows that there is definitely a very slow growth in, in interest. And I think we're gonna see stained glass grow much, much bigger. Have of um, famous artists collaborating with stained glass artists at the moment and doing pieces together. I think that is really great for the medium as well. And it creates also a bigger awareness. Um, yes, I think we all just were getting there. Great. I like your attitude. Yes. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you um, love stained glass. You know it has to. I, you know, you, this yeah, is not I, I agree. I agree with a lot of things you say. I think I agree with a lot of things you're saying, and I agree that a lot of people maybe have this love, but maybe they have this thing about they think it's kind of something impossible to do or too difficult. But actually, as you said, I think that during the interview, we see that it's a hard work, as you were always saying, a lot of hours, a lot of training, a lot of mistakes are proofs. And, but at the end, if you love it, as you do, I mean, what you did, what you are doing now, it's amazing. And it's about love something, go for it. And I don't know, for an instance, if you see something you're interested in, look for information, contact a person you think has a knowledge or you can ask something. I I learned that, that at the end, you can even, you have the resources, you have the people, and it's always better to ask, to go for it, to lose that fear and things just happen and it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it really, it is, it is, it's not as hard as you make it, as, as people think it is. It is actually, I have never worked a day in my life is how I lived my life. What I do is not work. So I get to live art and I get to live my glass. So, and I have my beautiful studio that I wake up to in the mornings. I'm in there, my pajamas in the mornings and I come out of there in the evenings with my glass of wine. Um, I spend a lot of time in there, not for, not because I work, but because I love it there and I love what I do. And, you know, my son comes in there and, and irritates me and draws whilst I work. And I try and limit that as much as possible. Of course, he's got his own little corner that's let free mm. and all of those things that people need to be aware of. But, um, and my friends come and visit me and they come and have a glass of wine. So to me, it's a lifestyle. It's not a job. Right. It's beautiful. It's the best Congratulations. Way from you deserve it. Hey. It's the best way of, of living. No, la, la mejor manera yes. de, de vivir, no? Especially so. when. Totally. No sé si me expresé Especially... bien, pero bueno. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, she understand what you said. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. Well, no, no, I was like, especially when your artwork has a lot of cat prints in it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, okay. that's the touch. <laughs> thank you so, very yes. much, <laughs> Annika. Yeah. Thank you uh, for your time, for this opportunity. Um, we celebrate 2022, the International Year of Glass, and say what you want, Maite. Yeah, we are, as we were saying, this is the last interview for the, that we did with Arcobe and Objetos con Vidrio with Maria Eugenia. We are pleased. Uh, and just for let you know, if you are watching this interview now, all the other ones are available on the YouTube channel of Objetos con Vidrio and Arcobe. You will see all the people we are interviewing, uh, the contact, all the information. Please, if you have any questions, you can contact us. We are happy to share everything and to show you more about these amazing este, placers and artists and we hope you really enjoy these interviews we did a lot we hope you also did Anika we are super happy <laughs> to have have you today and finish these interviews with with you and yeah just say thank you very much and just 
continue looking about the glass uh, and you will see you will love it. It's a wonderful work. And we hope to finish this 2022 uh, with a lot of new ideas and new energy to continue creating glass. Thank you to everyone. Yeah, thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you, Annika. Bye. Bye, bye.